Hello. Hello. So we're going to try a first here. I forgot my iPad, man. So I have to do the iPhone. So I'm going to be like this. Hi, everybody. So we're going to try it. My eyesight is really bad. I'm a stubborn man and will not get glasses, and I very much need them. So let's get started. So today, welcome all pre-medical students. We'll be studying photosynthesis. Um, and so it might be painful for some of you, but you're going to see some elegant examples of similarities to uh, what we saw in electron transport. Remember, that was the fuel that's keeping your core warm. Um, so, yeah, let's see what we can do. Hey, it works. So um, there's two parts to today's lecture. One is making ATP and reduced cofactors using the energy of light, um, transferring electrons from water molecules to NADH. You're like, oh, that's some crazy stuff. But then after that, we're going to use that energy that we made, ATP and NADH, to uh, assemble, uh, take carbon dioxide and turn it into a trio sugar. And so everything that you do, all the metabolism in you, is dependent on the energy produced by the breakdown of sugar. Now, we can make sugars through a process called gluconeogenesis, um, but the energy to make that comes from the breakdown of sugars. And so um, we don't exist without these processes. Um, you'll see some elegant examples of unintelligent design uh, in one particular enzyme. And you'll look at ways in which problems with enzymes can cause just uh, massive uh, difficulties for an organism. So if you look at the world, we're way out of equilibrium. If you go to a normal planet, um, you're not going to have like all this oxygen here. And so this oxygen has very high affinity for electrons. So it's, you know, it's rocket fuel. It's one component of rocket fuel. It's something that tends not to persist. And then we have, you know, the most stable form of carbon, right, is uh, the carbon dioxide. But in our world, there's all these sugars, these reduced sugars and fats floating around. So there's just something is very strange here. And so rocket fuel uh, typically dissipates, right? So you have oxygen here. It has one of the most high. Uh, is that fuzzy over there or is it my eyes? Does it look a little fuzzy? Oh, good. <laughs> All right, so you can't read it either. Okay, so oxygen is rocket fuel, and it tends, you know, we guess it, you know, it's going to want to grab some electrons from somewhere, right? Uh, and so there's this massive lack of equilibrium in our world, uh, and the reason is because, you know, this is sort of explaining that it's logical that electrons would flow to the molecules that have the highest electron uh, affinity. And so what's happening here is photosynthesis. It's creating this massive disequilibrium. This 20% of the atmosphere is oxygen. Um, that's, that's crazy. And so it's also making all these sugars. And this is providing the energy for us. We don't exist without um, this disequilibrium. We, we feed. We're a parasite on this disequilibrium. And so here's what we're talking about today are is a photosynthesis and carbon assimilation, a synthesis of sugars from carbon dioxide. And so you have uh, photosynthetic cells producing uh, reduced forms of carbon, and carbohydrates are some examples, and oxygen. And then the parasites, aka us, we're taking these molecules and putting them in a more stable state, right? So you're taking oxygen, converting it from rocket fuel down to water, and taking carbohydrates and burning them, right? So if you light a match on a tree, the spontaneous thing to happen is what we're doing. And so this is magical. Wow, how are you sort of con transforming this energy from the sun um, to create massive disequilibrium on a whole planet? So the magic occurs in these uh, chloroplasts. And so there's various features of this chloroplast. You have a total of three membranes. Remember with mitochondria, we had two membranes. The outermost was pretty permeable. Same situation here. Here you have this inner uh, uh, membrane here. Uh, and then you have thylakoid uh, membranes. And so all photosynthesis is occurring on these thylakoid membranes. 
The most inner sanctum, like three levels in, is called the lumen. Remember, we called that the matrix in mitochondria. So the inner part is called the lumen. And then all the space between these siloid membranes and this inner membrane on the outside here uh, is called the stroma. And so we're going to be producing ATP and reduced cofactors in the stroma, and we're in the same exact location we're going to be fixing carbon. We're going to take carbon dioxide and make sugar molecules. Uh, and so that minimizes uh, the amount of transport that we need to do. All right, so the uh, light reactions, um, which is the first part of the lecture, is uh, going to produce redu reduce cofactors. So we're going to take the energy of light and literally transfer electrons from water molecules onto NADP to make NADPH. We're also going to generate ATP. And we're going to do it in the exact same way we did it before, by setting up a uh, non-equilibrium of protons across a membrane. In this case, we're going to be pumping protons in uh, to the lumen of these thylakoid uh, membranes. And so the, it's a little bit upside down. Remember, before we were uh, in the mitochondria, we were pumping protons out into the endomembrane space from the matrix. And so that, but that gradient of protons is going to use the exact same enzyme to synthesize ATP. So the fuel, instead of burning and oxidizing sugars, the fuel is the energy produced by the sun captured by in these light reactions. Then in the second part of the lecture, we're going to take these, um, these short-term storage forms of energy, a reduced cofactor in ATP, and we're going to put those into a safer storage form of energy. So remember, we talked about you know, the comparison of uh, glucose monomers to polymers and the advantage of that having to do with the solubility and the reduction, the, re, uh, uh, the osmolality, uh, and so osmolarity, I should say. And so we have the same thing that we need to do here. We need to store a lot of energy, uh, and that's going to be this carbon assimilation part. Okay, but the, the, the power plant today is not the chemical oxidation of carbon atoms, it's the sun. And so you might be aware, um, many of you have taken physics class, that as the wave, there's an inverse relationship between the wavelength of light and the amount of energy there. So here it's expressed as uh, kilojoules per Einstein, right? So it's increasing. Einstein gets some props um, in this process. And so as you know, the wavelength decreases, the energy increases. So anybody gets a sunburn, you know, that's the light over here causing that process. And so this light energy needs to be caught by plant cells. And these are, this catching is done uh, by pigments. Okay, so photons impact pigments, not causing electrons to move between molecules like we saw uh, in uh, last lecture, but instead to cause those molecules to become excited, to, to elevate electrons to a higher energy um, orbital. Right? And so this excited molecule then uh, is going to transfer that excitement to other pigment molecules. And we'll see how that happens in a moment. And so for each uh, photon comes in, that is able to excite one pigment molecule. And when this, uh, this uh, uh, photon disappears, it's stored in the excited form of this pigment molecule. And there's two options at this point. We can either release that energy in terms of fluorescence. So if you just take chlorophyll you know, molecules and put them in a test tube, shine some light on it, it'll glow. And that's because uh, we're releasing that in the form of fluorescence. But the other thing you can do is if you very precisely and uh, pack together molecules that are able to be excited in this way, we can transfer energy without transferring electrons. So one molecule in its excited state, as it relaxes back to its ground state, it creates some kind of resonance, which causes a very closely neighboring molecule to then go into its excited state. So we're not actually going to be transferring electrons. We're doing this exciton transfer. And so this is solid state, right? So the, the, this is, there's no things moving between here. The, the change in the excitation state of a molecule you know, going back to the ground state affects neighboring molecules. And so that's, that's the antenna that we're going to be using. So these are the molecules that get excited. And so we're not like, when we saw in, um, 
in our last lecture, we saw the movement of electrons, right, to some of these metal ions. Here we're not changing the oxidation state necessarily as metal ions. We're changing the excitement of this molecule, right? And so we're causing it to go from its ground state to the excited state. And what helps us to do that is all of this uh, conjugation here. So the more conjugated the molecule is, it affects what energies can be absorbed here. And so we have different forms of chlorophyll, um, I can't read that. So chlorophyll A uh, is uh, just the methyl group substituent. Chlorophyll B is just tiny little change to the aldehyde uh, functionality. And these are similar to what we saw before in these heme groups. Um, so that we saw examples where the heme group wasn't changing oxidation state in hemoglobin, uh, myoglobin, and we also saw it uh, as an electron transport uh, functionality where we're moving electrons to and from here. Okay, and so when we excite these molecules, again, there's two options. Within 20 picoseconds of these things being excited, if that energy is not removed to another molecule, then it's going to be released as fluorescence. And so we need to be very, very quick uh, in the transfer of this energy. And so here's an example of a pigment molecule. Uh, and so it is a protein, and the, all these prosthetic groups, which are chlorophylls and these other conjugated molecules. And so as one of these uh, 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 pigments, so the chlorophylls, receives a photon, it becomes excited. And then within you know, a very short amount of time, if the molecules, if the excitable functionalities are close enough together, as one molecule returns to its ground state, instead of releasing fluorescence, it transfers, it causes a neighboring molecule to become excited. And so this is an example of one of these pigment molecules. And so this is what sunlight looks like in terms of wavelength. So the black line is at a particular time and day, there'll be a profile of light. Generally, um, the bluest uh, wavelengths are the most abundant. But you remember at sunset uh, and at dawn, it's more of a red color, right? You know, so we're from Rhode Island, red sky in the morning, solar take warning, you know some of these things. And so the color of the light coming onto plant cells is changing. And so there's got to be an, a, a way to adjust this. So look at these different chlorophyll molecules. So you have chlorophyll B. Um, chlorophyll, you might know, looks green. So if you have a, a test tube full of chlorophyll in solution, it would be green. Well, that's because it's absorbing everything but green. Right? So it's absorbing these blue frequencies and these red frequencies, so it appears green. The green is reflected back to you. Um, chlorophyll B has a similar but not identical um, set of absorbance spectra, and so that can absorb slightly uh, different wavelengths. So those are some of the most common uh, pigments in uh, plant cells. But in various cyanobacteria, you have different types of conjugated molecules due to the placement of different substituents and different amounts of conjugation, they happen to absorb at different wavelengths. And so this particular one, these phycoproteins, are absorbing uh, in the central green part. And often uh, these organisms can look red or uh, purple. And so there's other molecules all listed here. So this is a handy table to come back to to get a sense. So what we want to do is there's all this energy coming along. And we want to have sort of a mixture of different um, pigment molecules that can catch photons of different wavelengths. Right? So that would be more efficient. So we need to have mixtures of these things in our plant cells. And so the way this works is literally like a radio telescope dish. We're focusing all this energy into one hot position. So in the radio telescope, you focus the energy here, reflect it in, you take a look, and you find Martians, right? But here, you've got the thylakoid membranes, and it's circular as well. And you've got the pigment molecules, uh, these proteins with the set, uh, attached prosthetic groups. And these pigment molecules can become excited. And through this process I was talking about, this mysterious process of exciton transfer, you can transfer, you can cause neighboring um, pigment molecules to become excited when, you know, so, so you have one pigment molecule, receive, molecule receives a photon, becomes excited. As it returns to its ground state, a neighboring pigment molecule then becomes excited. So this is like a funnel. It's catching the light. And you can have, for example, here we have uh, green pigment molecules, and we have yellowish-orange pigment molecules. These are absorbing different wavelengths. But this 
this energy, once you've captured the photon, it doesn't, there's a, there, it's wavelengthless, right? It's just energy. And so we can transfer that energy into this central core. It looks like some kind of reactor. And so this is a little bit confusing, the way this is drawn. This is a reaction center. And it's important to realize that each color is a separate polypeptide. It's a separate protein. Okay, and so what we need to do here is to drive the synthesis of a reduced cofactor, we have to start separating electrons. Up to this point, we're just exciting molecules, and they're being excited, and the next one's being excited, but we have no redox change yet. So once, what the magic occurs in the reaction center, where we're gonna convert this energy that's being transferred to this residence excitotine transfer into a separation of electrons. And then we go right into an electron transport chain, just like we saw before. So let's look at this. So you have here, for example, starting in the pigment cell, say, say a distal pigment cell receives a photon. And that causes it to go to the, the energy of the pigment molecule to be excited. And this energy can be transferred without the movement of anything. It's solid state. There's no electrons or anything moving, um, causing a neighboring molecule to become excited. So in our uh, reaction center, we have all three of these polypeptides are in their ground state, right? And so, but we're slowly coming in uh, with the energized molecules. But then the, a pigment molecule right adjacent to the reaction center becomes excited. And when it returns to its ground state, you have transfer of electrons here. And so first, in one uh, molecule in the reaction center, you have, it becomes excited. But then here's the magic. A electron, because this is excited, it has a much lower affinity for electrons in its excited state. And, and we need, the, the, the game here is we need to transfer that electron to a different polypeptide quicker than we release the energy as fluorescence. So we have about 20 picoseconds here to do this. So we need some special pairing to be able to accomplish this rapid transfer. And so now we have literally evacuated an electron from uh, one of these reaction uh, uh, the, this reaction centers. And so now we have two electrons up here and we're missing one here. And you'll see processes today whereby we refill the electrons. We'll actually see electrons going in circles um, today. And it's pretty cool. They're recycled, right? Okay, and we'll be grabbing electrons from water, which is just sick. I don't you know. It just seems wrong, unethical. So here we have a light molecule. So this is uh, what's happening in plants you have these two chlorophyll uh, molecules that are so intimately close to each other, their orb orbitals are literally overlapping. When people first got the structure of this, they said, how in the world is this like staying together? These orbitals are so tight together. And the closeness of the molecules allows you to be able to transfer an electron. And so we have the precise, th these things are not, flo if things are floating around, then you're just going to, you know, you get excited, it's going to and you're going to release some of that heat. It'll just, you know, the molecule will vibrate. We've got to hold these molecules, not allow them to vibrate so we can do something with this energy. So within three picoseconds, I believe it says, three picoseconds, we transfer our electron from this special pair into this phycoerythrin, or a, a pheophyton. Uh, molecule. And so now this is the moment in which we've transferred the energy of this exciton transfer and separated charge. We've started the process of uh, creating reduced cofactors. And so this electron is first very, very rapidly, faster than this can decay back to its ground state in three picoseconds, transfer the electron to this other uh, molecule, and then we have an electron transport chain after that. So the, the electron is passing from one molecule to the next, moving uh, to a uh, 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 you know, finally onto a quinone. Now, there's two different types of quinones in these reaction centers. One is completely locked in place. It accepts uh, the, uh, the, uh, the electron very uh, quickly. So we get, with each single photon that comes in, one electron is moved, and only one. And so that one electron lands on the quinone, turning it into the semi-quinone. And then, but then that electron can be transferred to a second quinone um, to make, turn it into a semiquinone. And then a second photon of light comes in, 
Electrons are transferred here. You go to the semiquinone, and this goes to the quinol, the two-electron reduced form. And so in, in uh, electron transport, remember we talked about this ubiquinone. So it's a very similar molecule. It's called plastiquinone. And so I'll just say quinone, right, because it's the same thing. There's a, a oxidized state, one electron reduced semiquinone state, and a, a quinol, two electron reduced state. And so what we're doing here is accumulating two electrons on this mobile uh, electron carrier, if that makes any amount of sense. Is this okay so far? It's a little bit mystical, like cytons, and we've now separated charge. It will become more familiar. Any questions so far? Okay, good. So let's, so here is the same exact reaction center, but pay close attention to these charts. I almost always ask questions on these charts, and I think they're confusing. Ask me questions if you don't understand. And so on this axis here, the y-axis, we have E prime naught. What is, what is this? So this is reduction potential, or another way of saying is electron affinity, right? And so we have low electron affinity up here, negative numbers, and high electron affinity down here. So our exciton comes in and causes that special pair to become excited. And when it's in an ex excited state, that, uh, that uh, special pair of chlorophyll molecules now has a very low affinity for electrons. So that energy of the light is absorbed, causing the molecule to decrease its electron affinity. And now it's all downhill. We're just passing the electron to you know, each subsequent molecule that has an increasingly higher electron affinity. So you go first uh, from this special pair to theophyton uh, to a quinone. Um, you know, so we're accumulating a total of two electrons on the quinone. And then we have this. Cytochrome BC1, I believe it says, complex. Sound familiar? What might happen here when we get our two electrons? So let me give you a hint. Whoa! Cytochrome C! That's a one electron carrier. So we got to get that sick looking Q cycle going on in this guy. Uh, and when we do the Q cycle, we're going to be transporting four protons across a membrane. So we've now taken the light energy and transformed it into a disequilibrium of protons. And so this is one of the most primitive forms of uh, photosynthesis. This is in purple bacteria. And all this thing do does is sets up gradients. And we, we know we can plug all kinds of USB things into this, you know, charge across a bilayer, across a membrane, or we can synthesize ATP. So F0, F1, ATP synthase can say, cool, we've got a, a high concentration of protons in the lumen. I can let those pass back out uh, into the stroma, and I'll synthesize ATP in the stroma. So this organism is all about just making ATP. Uh, maybe it uses some other mechanism to make reduced cofactors, such as the pentose phosphate pathway. Here's another type of bacteria, this green sulfur bacteria. It has a reaction center here. Again, I haven't shown the y-axis, but this is it according to a, a decreasing a reduction potential, right? So this is neg more negative. These have a higher affinity uh, for electrons. I might have mixed that up. I don't know. So, so what we're doing here is we have, again, an excited special pair, uh, which has a reduced affinity for electrons. And these electrons, you have a choice, undoubtedly controlled through allosteric regulation. Choice one, make a gradient that uh, culminates in synthesis of ATP, amongst other useful things. Choice two, make a reduced cofactor. And so the way this works is we can transfer ferrodoxin, FD is a one electron carrier, um, but this reduction requires two electrons. So we would need two uh, photons to come in here. So each photon generates the movement of one electron. And we would accumulate those two electrons first on this enzyme, which the, then would be transferred to NAD to make NADH. Do you see a problem with this? <coughs> so in the previous slide, what happens at the bottom? Or in the cyclic pathway? 
the cyclic pathway the electron there was or that, that came off here comes back in right but in this process the electron that comes off here never comes back it's sitting on this NADH molecule and so you know this thing would grind to a halt it would, you know, once you removed an electron you're not going to remove another one out of there right and so we need some way to provide an electron back. If you were able to see the electron affinity, it's about, I believe, 0.5 here. And so um, the electron affinity of oxygen is 1. We're not going to be pulling any electrons off a water molecule. The oxygen molecule has too high of an affinity. right? So what it, this organism uses, it's in its environments, in these volcanic sort of environments, and. Uh, Yellowstone Park, and it uses hydrogen uh, sulfide. So it actually pulls the electrons out off of hydrogen sulfide, making sulfur and eventually um, sulfate. Right, and so it takes from what it what it has in its environment. Okay, does that make sense? How we need to replace this electron? Are you with me on that? Okay. And now all we're going to do is compare these, right? And so you have the purple bacteria. We have only the cyclic pathway generating a proton gradient using what's analogous to complex three in electron transport. You've got a Q-cycle action going on there. And then there's this other bacteria, this green sulfur bacteria, has slightly different redox potentials. Uh, this one does two things, multipurpose. It can create a gradient, which doesn't cause problems with electrons being evacuated out of the reaction center, um, stopping the reaction center. But then it also does this uh, reduction of NAD to NADH, and so we grab those electrons um, from another molecule. So what all plants have done is combine these two. So these bacteria have different photosynthesis, they're very primitive. What plants have done is to combine these. So put a big star on this slide, circle it. You got to understand the slide. Ask your TAs if, if I do a bad job. So in this, in plant cells, you have two coupled photosystems. And just remember, photosystem two is on the left, it's a little bit lower, and then photosystem is on the right. Each of these uh, becomes excited uh, by different wavelengths. So this is more by blue light, right? So the pigment molecules that tend to associate here are more of the blue light uh, type. And um, you could see that, they, they, that this uh, reduction potential here uh, is, you know, electron affinity is extremely high. Right, so electron affinity, oxygen, or redox potential of oxygen is like 0.8, I want to say. And uh, this is one. So this is really has intense amount of electrons affinity. Um, and so when we have photon comes into this first photosystem too, it goes into its excited state uh, and then can cause the movement of electrons to this pheophyton, to PQA, plastoquinone A, uh, going to the semiquinone, transfer it to this. This becomes semiquinone. Another photon comes in. Remember, the, there's n these are not necessarily uh, coupled, right? So when you have the mobile carrier, um, that's potentially being released and coming on. So you're not going to be taking two total electrons out of this r single reaction center, right? You've got to start from a reaction center that isn't already missing an uh, electron. And so we have two electrons accumulating on our mobile plastoquinone. Those two electrons get transferred just like we saw an electron transport into uh, this, uh, this complex three analog, which pumps gradients, has a Q cycle. Uh, and then those uh, electrons are transferred uh, not on a cytochrome C, but on a photoplastocyanin, and that's a one electron carrier. So same sort of translation problem we had before. And this electron is then transferred to the other reaction center. So this is a filling up process. And this reaction center then can receive, either through exciton transfer or through a photon, um, uh, it can become excited into its excited state. And then the electrons can be transferred for a variety of cytochromes. These are all one electron transfers. Here's an iron sulfur uh, cluster that's uh, passing along electrons, ferrodoxin. So when we get to ferrodoxin, we have a choice. We can either go cyclic or we can go 
terminal deposition of the electron onto an electron carrier. So if we go cyclic, those electrons um, can be transferred into here, into the uh, complex three analog, uh, and that can drive a gradient of protons causing synthesis of ATP. But if we then, tr the other choice we have, which is controlled by allosteric regulation, is to transfer those electrons to this uh, this molecule NADP oxidoreductase, um, which then can finally collect two, one electron at a time to, to, for a total of two electrons, and those two electrons can then, at one fell swoop, be transferred to NADP to make NADPH. But do you see, so any time we make an NADPH, we have the same sort of problem we were seeing with the green sulfur bacteria. We've removed an overall electron. So the electron that was here in this photocenter is ending up here, right, on this NADPH. So we need some way to replenish that electron. And this, uh, the electron affinity of this photo, photo center in, uh, in, uh, in photosystem two has such a high affinity, it literally pulls an electron off of water. So that's why, you know, on NASA, I say, see water on a planet, it's life. Because that water can be used to, as a source of an electrons, combined with solar energy to make a ATP and NADPH. Right? So does this make any amount of sense? Is it thoroughly confused? I think it's probably confusing. Alex, do we have any questions? I'll start it off there. No? I explained it well? No. That's not possible. Yes? Two's coming for one where? <coughs> um, yeah, so is there a reason why it's n numbered backwards? I actually don't know the historic rationale. Um, so these are endosymbionts. These cyanobacteria back a while ago um, went into plant cells, and they made these uh, chlorophyll. So the same, like, basically is purple bacteria and your green sulfur bacteria are now inhabiting in plant cells. And things have evolved since then, and, you know, but there's actually uh, ribosomes in there, there's, you know, DNA in there. But, yeah, it's a historic, some, that's a great question. I don't have a good answer. Does everybody understand? I think people are explaining to each other. Yep, do you want me to go through it one more time? Sure, sure. So, so the idea here is that we need to, to be able to assemble carbon dioxide into sugars, we need two things. We need ATP and we need reduced cofactors. Okay? And so in this photo, uh, uh, this reaction center, when we receive our uh, exciton or uh, when we receive a photon, um, the electron affinity is greatly diminished in that special pair. That electron is then transferred to pheophyton, uh, plastoquinone. Remember, I had that picture. We had the two plastoquinones. One is sort of glued in there, uh, and you transfer electrons pretty quickly to that one. And then the electrons are accumulated on the second plastoquinone, going to the semiquinone and then the quinol form. Those two electrons are then delivered to this one. We'll look at this in more detail in a moment. Uh, and then uh, we have a translation from two electrons to a one electron carrier in plastocyanin. What's driving, driving each of these transfers is electron affinity. We're on a chart here, right? So as we're going down, we have more and more electron affinity, and that's a favorable thing, to move an electron to a center that has higher electron affinity. And we can, uh, this drives a gradient, and this can replenish a depleted photosystem one. Right? So this electron can come in and eventually be deposited here. So we're literally physically transferring electrons from water to NADPH. Right? And this has a similar thing. A exciton or photon is received. The molecule becomes excited, has greatly, vastly diminished electron affinity, releases its electron to some cytochromes, uh, and then to iron sulfur uh, a cluster, and then to ferredoxin. These are all one electron carriers. And then we have this choice. We can either make more ATP or we can make NADPH. Okay? Right. I think we'll move on. 
Sorry, it's mystical. So these are the two confusingly named photosystem two. Just remember, the second one's on the left. It's a little bit lower. It helps you to actually be able to draw this diagram. Okay, and so here's photosystem two. Um, and look at the, where this is occurring. So remember, this is occurring in thy thylakoid membranes. And so uh, the uh, lumen, that's the innermost sanctum, right, of the thylakoid um, membrane. Uh, and so you have the electron or the protons uh, being pumped into the lumen. So this is sort of complex three upside down, if you remember from our last lecture. Same exact stuff going on. Um, the, the protons are being transferred when plastiquinone, in, in the case of complex three, it was ubiquinone or ubiquinol. When that is bound, those electrons are transferred. One goes to another fully oxidized uh, quinone. The other goes up to a, a carrier. Remember this? We're translating from two down to one. Uh, instead of cytochrome C and other mobile carriers, we have a variety of uh, ferrodox and plastocyanin. These are one electron carriers that can float around uh, and then uh, either interact with uh, acetoreductase to make NADPH um, or uh, go into this cyclic pathway. Okay, and so this gradient, so we are accumulating protons in the innermost sanctum of the thylakoids, the lumen, and that gradient can come back out and drive synthesis of ATP strategically in the stroma, exactly where you need it to be to do your carbon assimilation. So we're making both NADPH and ATP in the stroma. No transport is necessary to do your carbon assimilation. Okay, so this is very well designed. So this is the Q cycle, complex three analog. So you have your PQH2 uh, coming in. One electron goes to your carrier. Today, playing the role of cytochrome C is plastocyanin. So it's receiving that one electron. We're storing the other in a semiquinone form uh, of, uh, uh, that's available from the membrane. Remember, there's the same sort of strategy, strategic. It's like, oh, yeah, I think I'll grab that proton from the stroma and then eventually release it in the lumen. So we're strategically grabbing those protons from the right side of things. Okay, and so this is the same sort of Q cycle you saw before. Um, <clears throat> so plants don't walk, right? So that, there's some commercials where trees are running. I don't know if you've seen this recently. You wouldn't need this. What I'm about to show you, if the plant could say, dude, it's like real sunny and I'm going to go in a hut, uh, the plant can't put sunscreen on. It's just got to deal with, you know, it's there, right? It's, it's absorbing light. Light, a wavelength is changing in the dawn. There's nice red light. And during the day, it just gets blasted with more blue light. And, and in the morning, it's more red as well. And so there's each of these reaction centers is responsive. It has a different constellation of these pigment molecules surrounding them. And so as the light changes, these two systems need to see in perfect sync. So, for example, as the light gets more blue during midday, um, this photo system will start to go faster. It will receive more useful photons or excitons. And so we'll begin to accumulate uh, some PQH2, right? So if that, this is being excited at a faster rate, than this molecule. So we need a way to rearrange our antenna. Like, so when the station, you guys wouldn't know this, but before cable, you'd have to like point the antenna at the right place because some cloud came through. You know, maybe with dish, you have to do the same thing. And so this is where this is happening. There's a physical separation of these two photosystems in this pleated area of the membrane where you have different uh, stretches of membrane. They're all on top of each other. And that's where photosystem two hangs out. So light comes through all of this stuff. It comes through this cell membrane. It arrives here in these photosystems. Uh, and the, but you have these light harvesting complexes where your pigments are surrounding. This is that dish and all those little squares around them. Those are the light harvesting complex. And so there's two different forms, as it turns out, of this light harvesting complex. Um, the uh, photosystem one also has light harvesting complexes associated with it. They're not 
actually shown here, but there's a physical separation. The majority of these photosystem ones are in this so-called non-oppressed uh, region of the membrane. And also ATP synthesis occurs in the non-oppressed region because uh, that is where, um, if you put ATP uh, synthase in here, it's like, you know, it's, it's hard to get the substrates in, the inorganic phosphate and ADP, so those are over here. And so what happens here is as the PQH2 builds up, that's a signal saying we're out of whack. These two systems are operating at a, a different rate. And that signal is received by light harvesting complex two, causing it to go from this configuration where it actually cross-links parts of, uh, of the bilayer here and going into this bent altered conformation that's not able to do this cross-linking. And these light harv the antennas move, so they drift in the membrane to the non-oppressed region. So if you have all this intense light, we need to help these two photosystems to be operating at the same rate. And this is caused by a post-translational modification. So light harvesting complex two becomes phosphorylated on threonine. And on that, that kinase that does that is activated when PKH2, so PQH2, is an allosteric regulator of that kinase. And so that turns that kinase on, causing this, um, this uh, molecule, light harvesting complex, to change its conformation and then in increasing abundance aggregate with the photosystem one, the reaction center of photosystem one. Okay, and so that instead of moving and walking to another place, you just change the configuration of the antenna to make sure there's perfect, perfect, synchronous, perfect synchronicity between these two photosystems. Okay, does that make sense so far? No? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> okay. So this is, remember um, in uh, our electron transport, um, so we were uh, producing water molecules and we're moving uh, electrons to water molecule or to oxygen molecules making water molecules. This is the same exact thing in reverse. So this elect oxygen uh, evolving complex that sits on photosystem two on our bottom left. This thing is literally transferring electrons uh, from water um, up into the photosystem, replenishing the deficiency in electrons as that photosystem has released its, each electron. And we have, instead of a copper top battery that we saw in the, the other uh, um, complex four in electron transport, we have a magnesium top battery. And magnesium has the ability, instead of, we don't want to store electrons here like we did in the copper top battery in complex four, we want to store a deficit of electrons. So we have a different type of ion. Magnesium, there's actually calcium in here. Everything is positioned perfectly. And we build up an accumulation of a total of four positive charges. So we release an electron one at a time as needed uh, into our special uh, pair. Uh, and we accumulate four positive charges. And then in one fell swoop, we convert two water molecules into an oxygen molecule. So the picture in Leninger is very, very confusing. And so, so the, the goal, the same problems that existed in complex four exist here. We don't want free radicals. We don't want any kind of these reactive intermediates floating around. So we have to accumulate the, the lack of electrons and then in one move transfer, you know, transfer those electrons uh, back into this system here, replenishing these electron depleted magnesium ions. So the same strategy is going on here. Okay, so that's electron oxygen uh, evolving complex. Okay. <laughs> Photosynthesis. All right, so we have the F0, F1 ATP synthase. It's backwards. Uh, instead of pointing into the matrix, like we saw in the mitochondria, it's pointing out from uh, the thylakoid membranes into the stroma. So it's the same enzyme. Nothing has changed here. We got the camshaft. We got the boot going on. Um, the binding of ATP is really, really tight. You throw in some inorganic phosphate, some labeled water, all the positions label. It's the same darn thing. The proton gradient, remember in plants, we're accumulating proteins in the lumen. And those protons are then driving the rotation of the camshaft with the boot on it, and it's kicking out uh, ATP molecules. So ATP is synthesized 
emphasized in the stroma strategically because that's exactly where we need it. And so this was the first evidence that these proton gradients could drive ATP synthesis. We didn't discover this in eukaryotic cells or in mitochondria. We discovered it in plants. So you can take some of these silicoid membranes very carefully remove them from the plant cells without causing them to fall apart. Drop them in a beaker uh, that has a buffer. So, so say you put a pH 4 buffer through many hours, you will have diffusion of protons across this bilayer. It's slow, but it's not, you know, these bilayers are not 100% impervious to the movement of protons. So after a few hours, you'll have the the lumen, right, of the thylakoid membrane will then have a negative charge. The protons will have moved in. Then all you do is drop these uh, pH 4 thylakoid membranes into another beaker. You can spin them down. I don't know what you do. You get them in a different beaker with a different pH. You throw in some ADP, inorganic phosphate, and this thing just starts cranking out ATP. So you can literally watch it drive, the gradient drive ATP synthesis. Okay, and so from what we've been saying so far, this is the overall picture. Um, we also strategically place the oxygen evolving uh, complex in the lumen, right? Because one of the products is protons. That's helpful. It helps us to make a gradient of protons. So those protons can combine with the uh, protons generated by this uh, uh, cytochrome B6F complex, I believe. Uh, and that those, so you have six protons, and those drive ATP synthesis. But then in photosystem one, we can shunt electrons from water all the way to NADPH to make reduced cofactors. So both ATP and NADPH are being synthesized in the stroma. Make sense so far? So this is a summary slide. So it's just backwards. So here's mitochondria. Remember, protons were going from the matrix into the inner membrane straight, uh, space, driving ATP synthesis in the matrix. Here, we're pumping them into the inner sanctum, into lumen. We got uh, the protons accumulated there. And then we let them relax, um, this gradient relax, and that drives the camshaft, kicking out ATP molecules in the stroma. And so bacteria are also uh, different, also have F0, F1 ATP synthesis driven by proton gradients. Okay. Uh, so we, we have a lot to cover after this, so I'm sorry. So I'm going to give you a strict uh, three minutes or two minutes. I can't hear you, sir. Hello. We're one third through the lecture. We need to get going. Incredibly easy clicker question. You get negative points if you miss it. <laughs> okay. I need everybody to turn their thing in. Um, can you stop the? If you can stop the uh, polling. Everybody voted. 
today. This is just a break where we can relax. This question is not too painful. Equally is ungoogleable, if that's a word. <laughs> All right. Um, well, let them finish business over there. What's the answer? Cover your ears. Don't listen. <laughs> What's the answer? Yeah, we have chlorophyll. <laughs> right? I mean, you could have said, you're like, well, which kind of quinone, right? We got the uvic quinone and plastic quinone. They're both quinones. We've made it through the exotic part of the lecture. Now we're going to get some pathways. Remember pentose phosphate? <laughs> it gets worse. <laughs> it's mean to laugh, isn't it? Uh, okay. So we've generated energy, but we have this osmolarity problem. Let's settle down. Thank you. We have an osmolarity problem. If we start accumulating tons of ATP molecules, the, you know, the, the, the cell is going to start to swell with water. So we need a, a way to conveniently pack this energy away in a more compact form, in, in uh, polymers of sugars. So you might have thought, when you learned uh, in junior high school or high school, photosynthesis, say, yeah, you synthesize glucose. Eh! You don't synthesize glucose um, with photosynthesis. You synthesize triosphosphates. But then eventually it can be converted into glucose, but typically you never heard of the triosphosphates. So what we're going to do here is take ATP and NADPH. We're actually going to need more ATP than NADPH. So that's why you have to have a cyclic pathway, because you've got to do some amount of, you know, you have to make, every time you do the cyclic pathway, you get some more um, uh, protons moved and more ATP synthesized. And this is going to drive the synthesis of triosphosphates. And from there, you can just elaborate ad nauseum with uh, all kinds of anabolic pathways. You can do gluconeogenesis. We'll have a lecture dedicated to that where you can make hexoses and starches, uh, disaccharides. Um, you can make dreaded pentose, pentoses, uh, and those are important in a variety of different um, of larger biopolymers. So what we want to do here is take carbon dioxide and accumulate three carbon dioxide molecules into a triose. And you say, okay, how could this, have, like if I was designing things, I'm nowhere um, of that intelligence, but yeah, it's just how can you like, put these together? I just take three CO2s and just provide some massive jolt of energy and just have a triose come out? Or could I do this in some other more creative way? And so this is the whole thing. Now this is a very huge uh, sort of abbreviation of everything that's happening, but this is going to be a roadmap as we go through this. So there's three different stages that we'll be examining in more detail. The first stage is easy. We're taking this exotic ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, so this is a ketose. You know, remember we said ribose before, that's an aldose, but this is ribulose ketose, C2 position for those that remember the numbering. And we're going to take one carbon dioxide molecule, combine it with this five carbon uh, ketose to make two three carbon molecules. And so three, uh, and so the, the enzyme that synthesizes this is called Rubisco. Um, it's a massive player in biochemistry. It drives all this assimilation of carbon dioxide. That is the most important enzyme I feel in the whole class, even, even if you are pre-medical. And so these three phosphoglycerates are then converted, first making a better leaving group here, putting the phosphate, and then reducing. So we're taking the carboxylic acid oxidation state and converting it into the aldehyde, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Cha-ching! We know what to do with that. That's very so We saw that in glycolysis, right? So we can take that and shunt some of it off. So we can take glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. We can actually run glycolysis in reverse, a process called gluconeogenesis to make other sugars. But then, if we want this to be a carbon-neutral cycle, we need some way to recycle a 3-carbon sugar into a 5-carbon sugar. We've seen this problem before. Pentose phosphate pathway. So there's a lot of arrows in here. Uh, details, not important. Input and output 
important. So if you do the stoichiometry, you have three ribulose 1, 5 bisphosphates combining with three carbon dioxide molecules, uh, making six of these three carbon sugars, converted into a reduced form, six of those. One is siphoned off, three carbons in, one three carbon molecule going out, and then these five remaining three carbon uh, sugars need to be converted into three five carbon sugars. Carbon neutral, right? 15 in, 15 out. Okay, and so you can see we need more ATP than NADPH in this process. Okay, next. Yes, that's what I want. So this is it. This is the big daddy. Rubisco, ribulose, 1,5-bisphosphate, carboxylase slash oxygenase. Now, up to this point, we haven't seen the slashy enzymes. So slashy enzymes, th this is actually because this enzyme catalyzes two entirely different reactions. One that's helpful, the other that is utterly useless, that is the appendix of this enzyme, this leftover from evolution that wastes energy. Okay, and so we're going to be looking at both the carboxylase reaction, which is first, and then the oxygenase reaction. This enzyme is super essential. This is the thing that starts everything off in terms of making sugars, storing energy from the light into stable forms. And so this enzyme is incredibly slow. So you're only able to convert uh, three per second with this enzyme. So half the protein in the chloroplast is Rubisco because it's so bad. It's so, it has such a low turnover number, right? But it's so critically essential that once evolution made it, it's like, dude, if I like change one amino acid, uh, life might stop. Life is dependent on this enzyme. So evolution stopped very early on here, so that's enough messing around with that. And so we're left with having to make tons of this protein in the cell. So let's look at the reaction. So here is our ketose, our ribulose, 1,5-bisphosphate. We're going to carboxylate here at the uh, C2 position. And that carboxylation, after we carboxylate, we're going to break that carbon-carbon bonding, mating, making uh, two, three phosphoglycerates. Right? Like, cool. Pretty, pretty stand, straightforward so far. So we're solving this problem. You know, it's not really chemically that desirable to take three carbon dioxide molecules and make a triose directly. Instead, it's a lot easier to stick one carbon dioxide on this big molecule and then cleave it into two and have this sort of stoichiometry manipulation game that it's playing. And so this is the carboxylase reaction. Now we need to do that uh, reduction, two electron reduction here um, from the 3-phosphoglycerate to the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Uh, th this picture is confusing. Why is it confusing? All the reactions occur in the stroma. It looks here like you're going in and out of the thylakoid membranes. No, they're in the background. Right? So this is, uh, all of these reactions occur in the stroma. So these two red arrows are the two arrows down here. Okay? The rest of this is the yellow box. The other reactions, once you make your glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate here, you can convert that, you know, remember triose phosphate, that's the, the diffusion, that's super fast enzyme. You can make your dihydroxyacetyl phosphate run glycolysis in reverse, make uh, sugars that can be assembled into polymers. We can take things out of the chloroplast uh, into the cytosol. We can do a similar reaction. We can make more mobile forms of sugar that we can transfer so sugar cane, right? It's, that's where sucrose is hang hanging out. Um, we can uh, drive, uh, we can uh, metabolize these in the cytosol using glycolysis. Yes, plants have glycolysis. Yes, they have mitochondria and aerobic respiration. It's like, that's a little where they're like making oxygen and CO2. Yes, it's true. Okay, so these are the two reactions, these two arrows. And so we've put some ATP molecules in here, and we've also provided a reduced cofactor, because the goal here is to, to take a carboxylic acid and reduce it to an aldehyde. So we need these uh, NADPH, and that's provided by uh, the photosystems that I showed you a moment ago. Um, those electrons came from water, and they're now being deposited on this triose. Okay, with me so far? So that's stage two. Uh, the next stage is not fun. Um, big picture. Count the carbon atoms, right? 
So you're gonna let's let's just look at this. So we have two, one, two, three, four, glyceraldehyde three phosphate ish molecules, right? This one's convertible. Remember, triosomerase uh, can interconvert these, so it really is. Um, of, of four of these glyceraldehyde three phosphate, and then we have you know the the, the usual transketolase catalyzed food fight where we're transferring carbons between molecules. How can we pronounce this? Sedoheptulose one seven bisphosphate. Don't worry about it. Four three carbons coming in here so far. Um, pentose phosphate no ATP is used. Different. In the second part of this pathway, ATP is used. Why? Because in pentose phosphate, we made a monophosphorylated sugar, 5-carbon sugar. Here, we're making a diphosphorylated sugar. So we need, that's a more energetic form of the molecule, and we need ATP to do that reaction. So here is our fifth 3-carbon uh, sugar, 5, 3-carbon sugars coming in. And let's count the output. There should be 3. One, two, three. Cha-ching. So we have carbon neutral pathway, but we've used some ATP. Right? But these are useful. We have a now we, we've regenerated our molecule that can then accept another carbon dioxide. So we're assembling carbon dioxide into glyceraldehyde three phosphate. It's a cyclic carbon neutral process driven by light energy that produces both ATP and NADPH. You with me so far? That's the whole thing. You know, I am not going to say, okay, fill in the blank time. No. <laughs> Just count the input, output. Remember, ATP is used where it isn't in pentose phosphate. Remember where this is occurring. This is occurring in the stroma, same location as um, ATP synthesis and NADPH synthesis. Okay, you with me so far? This is the bread of life. We siphon off our glyceraldehyde three phosphate, uh, and so we have a total of three carbon dioxides coming in, and one three carbon sugar coming out of this pathway. We've used more ATP than NADPH. So you only want to be doing this when the lights are on. If the lights go off, this needs to turn off, because if the lights go off, then there won't be ATP and there won't be NADPH. That'll rapidly be used up. The thing that's producing ATP and NADPH is light. So we need a crosstalk between these pathways to communicate this. So here we have Calvin's cycle represented as Mickey Mouse. In Calvin's cycle, <laughs> what the allosteric regulation here is the movement of protons. So we have, in this case, protons moving into the lumen, Higher concentration of protons there, lower concentration there. There's actually a transporter, magnesium. There's a pH-dependent transporter. Uh, so in, uh, so uh, the pH in the stroma increases from 7 to 8, and the magnesium concentration uh, uh, increases from 1 to 6 millimolar uh, when the, there's light. And so that's the signal. And si that's the signal both uh, to uh, one of the gluconeogenesis enzyme, fructose, 1,6-bisphosphatase, which is in here somewhere, and that's also the signal allosteric regulator. Both of those molecules are allosteric regulators of Rubisco. So when the light goes off, it all shuts down, and then it's just the mitochondria providing the fuel for the night. We're taking those sugars that were stored during the day, and we're using them at night. We're not going to stop living at night. We need to keep going. pH regulation. This enzyme, the evolution stopped too soon. <laughs> And so this enzyme can also do something, Rubisco can do photorespiration, where oxygen molecule can bind at the exact same position that the carbon dioxide bound. And so when the oxygen binds there, instead of making two, three carbon sugars, we're not adding a carbon from carbon dioxide. So if we just break, we do a similar reaction where we break the same exact bond that we did when we added the carbon dioxide, we're going to end up obviously with a three carbon sugar and a two carbon sugar. And the problem is, this is not good for much, right? And so this uh, three or two phosphoglycolate, the, 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 the plant's like, ah, I, I, gotta, I gotta somehow convert this into something that's useful, like a three phosphoglycerate. You say, okay, isn't there like this really 
um, helpful enzyme that in one step just adds a carbon dioxide to this? No. <laughs> All we're doing here is adding a single carbon so we can take this, this byproduct and not, we don't want this byproduct just accumulating forever. We want to take it and feed it back into the Calvin cycle, right? Um, we want to have our 3 phosphoglycerate. And so here's the adaptation. It involves three organelles. It's like, I don't want to deal with this. You deal with this. So first we have the chloroplast. We have this um, enzyme that's screwed up, put an oxygen molecule and made a glycolate. And the chloroplast is like, I have nothing to do with that besides transport it out. In the peroxisome, a, a glyoxisome is a type of peroxisome. We have glycolate gets moved in. We take another oxygen molecule. We're going in back in the reverse direction here. We're taking oxygen and we're dissipating it. So we take oxygen, uh, making hydrogen peroxide. You know we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't have to. That's very reactive to make glyoxalate. It's like, oh, cool. Well, you know, we could do our anaplerotic thing with uh, glyoxalate, yes. Or you could feed it into the Calvin cycle. So then we can say, you know, convert it to glycine, transaminate the glyoxalate. We can take two glycines, so we would need two glyoxalates, glyoxalates to feed in to make two glycines. We can then re <coughs> combine two glycines while reducing and or, or, or transferring electrons to NAD, making CO2, making serine. I mean, it just is like absurd. This one simple little problem. And then we have serine. Mitochondria says, I don't know what to do with that. We pass it back to the glyoxisome. Uh, comes in here, serine, gets converted to hydroxypyruvate, glycerate, uh, and then uh, we come back in and say, ah, 3-phosphoglycerate. That's where we want it to be. But we've wasted energy. So we're sort of neutral in this respect. Uh, we've made an NADH in one compartment. Uh, we used it up in another, so we might have to transport, waste some energy moving things around. But here's the problem. We had to use an ATP. So we've just wasted energy because of a side reaction. Because of this side reaction, less carbon in the world is assembled into reduced sugars. And so as it turns out, this screwed up reaction in Rubisco is heat sensitive. The more you warm up Rubisco, the more it screws up. The more oxygenase activity it has. Okay, and so this, is a, so this photorespiration is one way to deal with this, and something called a C3 plant, but there's this other uh, type of plant, a C4 plant. And in the C4 plant, um, it's hot. These plants occur in environments that are more hot, where Rubisco is screwing up more frequently. And so we have more of this, uh, uh, we potentially would have more uh, problems uh, with the side reaction. And there's two strategies. In the C4 plants, um, we're going to hide um, the Calvin cycle from the environment. So we're going to have one, normally, the Calvin cycle occurs in cells that are exposed to air. But here, what we're going to do is we're going to hide our carbon dioxide. We're going to bring our carbon dioxide in, and we're going to use an enzyme that has specificity, and we're going to stick that carbon dioxide uh, on a three carbon sugar to make a four carbon sugar convert that into malate, right? And then we're going to take that malate and bring it into a place that's not exposed to air. So we're using the discrimination of this enzyme. This enzyme doesn't do anything with oxygen. Oxygen can come in and out of its cell. That's not going to affect the synthesis of malate. Now, when we're protected from oxygen, we're going to release that carbon dioxide, and that avoids the, the side reaction, the photorespiration. So now we have carbon dioxide uh, feeding in the the Calvin cycle, and this is an airtight uh, compartment. Option two is the cactus method. So in cam plants, cactuses, other things that are, if it's really, really hot, maybe you just want to shut everything down during the day. So if it's really hot, uh, plant cells have pores, or plants have pores in them, and that allows moisture to come out, and also allows the exchange of gases. But in the desert, you want to, it's really hot, and you want to, you know, shield, you want to close these pores, and that blocks the loss of water, but it also blocks the exchange of gases. And so in this plant, uh, during the night, um, the pores open up, 
right? And carbon dioxide comes in, and we use that enzymatic speci specificity that Rubisco doesn't have, that the same enzyme that we saw before does have. So we synthesize, we fix that carbon dioxide into oxaloacetate, and that is converted just as we saw in this uh, C4 plants, uh, or C I should say C3 plants. Now I'm mixed up. C4 plants. We have the same enzyme. We have malate. Instead, now we're going to put the malate in a vacuole and wait for day. Because we can't do Calvin cycle at night. But we're storing up there um, this uh, carbon dioxide in the form of malate. It's sitting in a vacuole. When the light comes on, the malate is re released, carbon dioxide is released, and we can do the Calvin cycle. And so these are different ways that uh, different organisms are adapting to this just pointless reaction. And so one uh, philosophical question that comes up is, maybe we should fix it. You know, maybe we should make change do some kind of mutational analysis where we get around this problem with this side reaction. Say, OK, then the plants will grow faster. <laughs> That's probably good, but you know, got to be careful when you start doing these kinds of things. So this is, uh, this is uh, plants for today. Thank you. I think that's it. Any questions? I think that's it. A couple, uh, couple questions. Yeah. One about uh, water. Um, if photosystem 2 is oh, continually is awesome. oxidizing water, I love this question. and nothing seems to ultimately regenerate water, is the planet being sucked dry? This is an awesome question. Whoever asks that, you get an A, man. Email me. Uh, it would be sucked dry if the parasites weren't around. So what happens in the parasites? Us. We make water. We're going the. We're taking that oxygen, converting it back to water. You know, seventy percent of you as a biochemical entity is water. And that's uh, a great question. And a question about light harvesting complex too. Um, if a structural change in the membrane uh, activates the light harvesting complex two, how does that push it toward photosystem one? And there's a follow-up to this, uh, if you want me to ask that. Yeah, so it's just the conformational change causes that light harvesting complex two to not be able to cross-link membranes. And so then it just diffuses into this non-oppressed region. So diffusion is somewhat random, right? Things will go in every which direction, but it doesn't need, you know, when it's in the in the, that linear form, when it's not phosphorylated, it's stuck in place because it's cross-linking bilayers. So it's free to do whatever it wants, and it simply diffuses to the other area. But not all of it, just enough to balance the rate of synthesis of PQH2 um, to match the flux through uh, photosystem 1. Okay. And uh, the, the follow-up was, how does it uh, know to start preferentially working for photosystem 1? So I'd say it again. How what? does the light harvesting complex two know to preferentially work for photosynthesis? It doesn't. It just has the ability. It's being tra It's not that it's being drawn like a magnet to photosystem one. It's trapped with photosystem two when it's cross-linking the bilayers because photosystem one only occurs in the non-oppressed membranes. Okay, and so when you release, when you're basically pulling up the anchor, right? So when you phosphorylate that protein, it's now free to diffuse. When it's not phosphorylated, it's cross-linking the bilayers, and that's the area where you have photosystem 2. Photosystem 2 stays in that area. These are good questions. All right, guys. Good job.
you were waving around and you lost an iPhone. Right. The person really seemed convincing. Um, yeah, and you were 